Earlier this month, Pat Cahill, who is a member of my online boat building clinic that I hold once a week, volunteered to come down and help me process Victoria's old planks. So Pat scrapped off most all of the old paint. Once that was done, we then ran it through the planer and got it down to an even thickness. That was then cut into strips and these will be ready to be mounted onto the new Victoria. So I'll explain more about all of that process uh, in a later video, but let's not get ahead of ourselves quite yet. Uh, in this video, what I need to do is to get all of the line drawings done for Victoria. So let's get started doing that. The line plan is probably one of the most important drawings in a set of plans because it's from the line plan that you loft the boat to full size. So it's very, very important when designing a boat that you get the line plan absolutely accurate. So let's get started on working on the line plan for Victoria. I've always been fascinated with the way the old masters built and designed boats. And it is truly a part of my boat building journey is to learn about those things. So one of the best ways to learn about how to design a boat from a half hull model is to actually design a boat from a half hull model. So I have in my hands here my final iteration of Victoria's half hull model. I carved probably three models before I got to the one that I really liked. So now that I've got this part done, the next step is to determine where the station marks need to be on the boat. So last week I re-watched the video from the live broadcast from the boat show where Steve John Harris from Chesapeake Lightcraft and myself had a roundtable discussion about the design of Victoria. One of the things that we covered was creating flotation chambers throughout the boat so that in the event it got swamped, it wouldn't completely sink. So to do that, we're going to create a chamber at the aft, behind, underneath the aft seat, in the, under the center seat, and in the fore uh, part of the boat right uh, in front of the mast. So in thinking about this, uh, it occurred to me that these bulkheads could actually be part of the form one of the station marks so that when I was planking the boat and laying it out that that would be a form that stayed in the boat permanently. Uh, one of the things it's going to fit perfectly and also it would save also uh, station marks that it didn't make sense to me to put a station there and then to remove it later. So when thinking about that I've laid out some station marks here on the model and Steve gave me uh, two dimensions last week when I spoke to him. The first dimension was from the aft end of the stern here to the front of the first bulkhead. And that dimension, he gave me a variable between uh, 20 to 22 inches. The next measurement he gave me was from this aft bulkhead to the uh, aft side of the center seat and that dimension he gave me is 27 and a half to 33 inches. Now, why is that critical? Well, the critical part here is if you picture this upside down uh, on top of the cabin roof, there is a hatchway and that hatchway has to fit up inside of this empty space in the boat. So it's very critical of the di distance between here and here and here and here. So what I realized in laying this out was that I did not have the dimension from the stern up to the aft side bulkhead for the center seat. So I need to find out that dimension from Steve. So the best way to do that is to give him a call. Hey Steve, how you doing? Yeah, uh, not too shabby. Yeah, uh, you have a good time at uh, the uh, boat show. 
Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of people. It was pretty intense. It was good, but it was a lot. <laughs> ah, well, I wish I'd been there. Hey, so last week when we talked, um, there were you gave me two dimensions: one from the from the uh, stern to the front of the aft seat, and then the space between them. Yep. Okay. Yeah, where the hatch is going to have to go up between the yeah. center board and the aft seat. Right, right. So um, what I realized, because you gave me variables, you, I think you said yeah. like 22, 20 to 22, and then the other is 27 to 30. So if I made them all small, I was afraid that the aft side of the center seat would be too far aft. So if you could measure for me from yeah. the stern to where the front of the hatch would be. So you have about 20 inches from the sternmost part of the boat to where the hatch is. Starts. Yeah. Okay. 20 inches. Yeah, and that's giving a little bit of wiggle room. Okay. So if you end at 20 and a half, it would probably be okay. If mm -hmm. you ended up at 22, it probably wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. So now, if you'd measure from the from the aftmost part of the uh, tender to the front of the hatch, fifty would be comfortable. Okay. So let me see what I have here. Okay. So I've got f exactly four feet. So that'll be a little too tight. Yeah. won't quite make it. Okay, well, that's why I wanted to check that. So really, I need to make it two inches more forward. So that from the very back of the boat to the aft side of the seat bulkhead, or aft, actually the aft side of the seat is um, 50 inches. Yeah, 50 would get us more comfortable. 51 would be but 50 will work. 51 would be better. Okay. All right. Well, I will adjust that then. I think it'll be fine to move that seat forward a little bit. Well, we're, well, we're going to have to. We don't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> and, if, and from my experience, uh, like I had mentioned, I think, last week of the tender, that um, the center seat, if there's any kind of a load at all on the back side of the boat, you really have to move to way to the front. So I think by okay. being a little bit more front, uh, two things happen actually. It makes the dagger board fit a little better. And also, um, I think it'll balance the boat out a little better. Because chances are, you're going to have something in the boat with you. Yeah. More than likely. Yeah. Two of them. <laughs> at, at minimum, another human being. <laughs> Well, Steve and I continued to talk for probably another half an hour about some construction details that will be coming up in the future. Okay, so I've made those changes that Steve and I uh, talked about. So the first thing that I did was I moved the aft seat bulkhead forward. So now I have it at 20 inches. And then the aft side of the center seat is 51 inches. And then the seat itself is uh, one foot wide. So you can see where I moved these forward a little bit and I moved them just about two and a half inches and this one is just about an inch farther, uh, well, an inch or inch and a half, something like that. So now that I have all of the uh, station marks figured out, uh, the next step is to devise a way to take points off of the hull in order to build the body plan. As many of you know, I'm a big fan of Nathaniel Green Herrenschaff, the great American boat builder. Now, when Captain Nat would start to design a boat, he always started with a half-hull model. 
mainly because it's really truly the best way to get all of the lines fared properly on the boat. Once he got that done, he then used the model to pull points off of it with a three-dimensional measuring device that he had invented. Here in the model room at the Herrschaft Museum in Bristol, Rhode Island, we can see Halsey Herrschaft, Captain Nat's grandson, demonstrating the takeoff instrument that Captain Nat had designed. With this instrument, various points can be engaged on the hull at chosen stations. As the pointer engages with the hull, at that point, the height can be read on one gauge and the offset from the center line with the other. See, it's seven sixteenths. Well, you just saw how Nathaniel Herrenshoff had come up with a device in order to take points off of the half hull models that he had created. So I've come up with my version of that with some materials that I found simply at a, a local big box store. So basically what I have here is a speed square, a uh, digital caliper here, and a ruler, a couple of rulers on here. Uh, so this is going to allow me to be able to measure the X, Y, and Z axes of the half hull model and then record them. The way that I constructed this, uh, you can see a little bit more detail about that in a video that I did, one of my live videos, I believe it was August 6th. Uh, you can watch that video here and learn a little bit more about the construction of it. Or if you're on my Patreon account, in a week or so, I'm going to have a detailed um, video just on how I built this measuring device. So let me show you how the device works. Taking the points off the hole is a pretty straightforward process. Now I've already done stations from the stern up to a midship, which is station six. And that happens to be the aft side of the center seat bulkhead. So let me show you how we take points off of the model. So in constructing the model, I spray painted some black paint in between the uh, lifts so they get a nice crisp water line. I've then drawn a parallel line here on the backboard and then lined up the water lines with that so then I know all of my water lines will be in perfect registration. I then marked up here the station marks. So what we're going to be doing is taking the offset off of station six. So I've already set the caliper to zero off the backdrop, which is actually the center line of the boat. Now we've got it all lined up with the loaded water line here. And now it's just a matter of pushing the caliper in until it engages the hull like that. And what I have is 2.72. So now I'll record that offset on my sheet. So then the next lift we do is we come down and move the y-axis down so that we become come in contact with the water line one. And there we have 2.88. I don't need to record the water line off of my y axis here because I know each water line is exactly 5 eighths of an inch apart. Where this does come into important play is where the shear and the keel engage with the caliper. And then I will need to read that number because those two things will change. So that's basically the process. So now what I'm gonna do is to go through and get all of those points registered on my sheet.
All right, so that's the last measurement that I need for my table. Now, it's my understanding that Captain Nat's offset measuring device actually took into account the scale of the model. So the readings that he got were actually the offsets for the table of offsets. And that instead of doing a line drawing, that table went directly to the shop floor and they were able to start laying out the boat. Mine's not quite that sophisticated, so what I'm going to need to do is to draw a line plan in order to scale off of that and get a table of offsets. So that's what I'm going to do next, is to draw a line plan for Victoria. So you can see I've gotten started with the drawing, and I've put the profile view on here already. Now, it was pretty simple to get because we already had that profile from our half hall model. And then I laid out all of the station marks where they needed to be. And this line here is the baseline. The smallest dimension that I had uh, for my shear was 3 eighths of an inch, which is, this is the longest one here at station six. So I've over here, I've started the body plan, and this is uh, station six laid out. Now, if you remember, a body plans, this side goes from the stern forward, and this side goes from the stem backwards. So what we're gonna draw next is station five. Now, it just so happens that six and five are the two bulkheads that will be where the seat is. So the way that I do this is, first of all, I needed to know where the bottom of the, where the keel is. So what I'm going to do, instead of actually measuring it, I'm going to just line this up and make a little tick mark where that is. Now, it's no surprise that it's very similar to station six. So now, in order to lay this out, I then pull out my chart here. And what I'm doing is using my calipers <clears throat> to measure. So in five at the loaded water line, which is this one right here, this is L, W, L, and this is L, L, one, and this is L, L, two. So at five at L, L, one, it's four point, or I'm sorry, 2.42. So if I, my caliper's here, and I turn it to two, two point four two, there. So now what I can do is I can use my calipers to measure over so that I know that I exactly have that. That way I don't have to worry about converting the hundreds and tenths and hundredths of an inch into fractions. So then the next one, we go, now we go over here to uh, waterline one, and we have 2.62 there. And we come over here and measure that one. And then at waterline two is 2.7. Here. And then at the shear, we have also 2.7. So that's going to be the same thing. Now, in order to, to find the shear, we go up here to number five to where the shear meets there and come over and make a little mark. So that is now, we know that it's the same distance is this one, so we can go over at 2.7. All right, now <clears throat> what I need to do is just connect these dots, and I'll do that with my yacht curves here. So we just need to find one that's going to fairly well match. There's the one. All that, and then we need to finish the upper part. Okay, so that is station 
5. As many of you know from past episodes that I took the yacht design class from Paul Gartside while attending the Wooden Boat School out in Brooklyn, Maine. I thought it'd be interesting if you could see his teaching style, so I have a short video here where he's explaining spline weights. So in the meantime, while you're watching that, I'll finish putting together this body plan. But the thing we come up against right away is we have to be able to draw curved lines. And we use two basic sets of tools to do that. For the sharp curves, for the tight curves, we use plastic yacht curves. And you can still buy these little yacht curves. Now for the long curves, these guys don't work. We have to use battens and weights. And we used to use wooden battens in the old days, now we use plastic ones. They're hard to buy now, so if you're setting up, you have to kind of make them yourself. You can buy little strips of plastic at the plastic stores. You can buzz them off on a table saw if you've got a really good blade and strips of plexiglass. Anything that bends uniformly is, is what we need. And we hold them in place on the paper with lead weights. And this is what we're going to talk about is the lead weights. So to draw a curve, we do this. Now this set of weights here, you will notice, have little uh, brass hooks on the end which engage in a groove in the top of the spline. This batten or spline is made specially for the purpose and it has that little groove and it's meant to be used with these weights which have the little hook that fits in the groove. And we can see we can, we can push that batten around, make any curve we want with a set of weights like this. Now, a word or two about the type of weights we use. This is one type with the hook that fits in the groove, but if you don't have a groove batten, this is, they're kind of superfluous. You can use them still, you can sit them on top of the batten. If the batten doesn't have a groove, they still work. However, I'm not crazy about the type with a hook in for the very simple reason that there's a big danger that you will snag your paper with a hook and tear it, and then there'll be bad words and gloomy mood will fall over the drawing office <laughs> when that happens. So I like the ones without the hook. Um, and the favorite ones, the ones that I really favor are these. They have no hook, but they have a little, it's a lead weight, but it has a wooden base on it, which is screwed into the bottom of the lead weight and has a little snub nose that sticks out and that sits on top of the batten like this and I find that's perfectly adequate. It can sit on top or you can nudge it against the bottom of the batten and that works just fine. When it comes to the shape of the drawing board weight these things are known as ducks often as not. You can see they come in a variety of shapes. These are really simple little rectangular block. This is a little more artsy. It has the weight forward and a little sort of fishtail shape and the sides are scooped out so you can pick it up easily. These are the sort of top of the line weights. However, um, I find the key thing one of the important characteristics of the, of the drawing board weights is that you can get them close together because when you're doing a tight curve you very often want tight control so you'll have a bunch of weights which are quite close together and these tall narrow ones they stack better than the fat ones so even though these are beautiful things I like the you know this kind of style this is my favorite style of drawing board duck. It weighs about five pounds and it's about an inch wide and a couple of inches tall and it has this wooden base and a little, little nose that sticks out and a piece of, um, piece of felt or base glued to the bottom so it doesn't uh, scratch up the paper. Now the number of, of these that you need is also a question of much discussion. 
It's a bit like um, G clamps in the shop. What do they say about G clamps? You can't be too rich, too beautiful, or have too many G clamps. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little the same with draw board weights. Um, I have a set of 10 of these, and I use them all. You know, if you're drawing a long line with a sweep in the end, you'll find you'll need nine or 10 ducks to, to get that line fully controlled. So that is my recommendation. Five pound lead weight. You can make these yourself. These were all cast up in a little simple concrete mold um, with a wooden base screwed on. Make a set of 10. Paint them so you're not getting lead on your hands the whole time. Stick a bit of felt on the bottom so that they don't scratch the paper. That's all you need to design a boat. About a month ago, Matt Muller, a fellow classmate that was in the design class with me, contacted me and asked me if I'd like some spline weights that he had been making. He had made them from Paul's design, and I, of course, said yes. He was kind enough to share the process of sand casting them in lead with us. He began by making some wooden patterns out of oak. He then used a disc sander to get the final shape and finished with epoxy so that they would release easily from the sand. Once in the flask, he started by ramming up the sand. He's using an oil sand here called Petrobond. After striking off the flask, he then turned it over and removed the patterns. After the lead had melted, which is around 625 degrees Fahrenheit, 330 degrees Celsius, he was then ready to pour the lead into the open face molds. He did this four more times so that he ended up with 10 spline weights. After some cleanup, he mounted them on some wooden soles and gave them a coat of epoxy. After some final shaping of the bill, Matt painted them a beautiful red. Thank you, Matt. You certainly made them beautiful. I will cherish these forever. So I'm just putting the water lines in here and you can see I'm using my new spline weights, AKA ducks. So the last, this is the loaded water line that I'm putting in right now. And mark along here. I'll slide that one out of the way and mark. Yeah, so we'll see what we have here. Yeah, pretty good. Now the way that I um, determined these was I basically just went over. So for example, we'll say uh, number nine right here. Then I just went over from the center line. That distance is the same as this distance here. Um, actually, it's down here at the water line. This distance right here is the same as that. So what I did is put little tick marks at each one of the station marks and then um, transferred that information over here. Now one of the things about the um, body plan here is I moved station six over to the uh, four side of the drawing because station seven was actually beamier this distance is greater than this distance. So now you can see that uh, these are all of the station marks. And this is what we'll need to now make a table of offsets for so that we can start lofting the boat. Um, one of the things you might notice is that there's the, a lot of times when you look at uh, drawings like this, these station marks will be more uniform. Now, why that is not that way on this is because of the way we had to move these two bulkheads that are going to be uh, where the center seat is. So you can see like this space is a much different uh, spacing than some of the others. So typically where you're putting molds in there, you would have all of the station marks a uniform amount. But because of the circumstances that we have uh, for Steve's tender, um, this is what we're going to end up with. Now that I've got the basic line plan all drawn out, I can now develop a table of offsets. 
And from that table of offsets, we can then loft the boat. We're running out of time this week, but we'll cover all of that in the next episode of The Art of Boat Building. So as always, thanks for watching.